excited to introduce you to co-owner of Lakata, my mentor, Clayton, who teaches me all about the different types of tequila. I'm Jeff. I just retired from the military, sold everything I own, and now I'm traveling around the world to learn from brewers, winemakers, distillers, and tell their story. This is my journey of beer, wine, and spirits. I had been coming to Mexico since about 1995, really fell in love with the language and the culture as a teenager and was living in a different part of Mexico over on the Gulf Coast. Started getting really interested in the beverage, started trying a lot of different tequilas, noticed how different they could be, noticed how some were exquisite and some were really, really bad, yeah. and got curious about why that was, how, how something that nominally on the label seemed to be the same could be so wildly different. So after living in Veracruz for about a year, I had read everything I had got my hands on about tequila, both in Spanish and English, and it just seemed bizarre. Uh, this plant, this weird spiky plant that doesn't need water for most of the year, that can go through long droughts and survive, that takes seven or eight years to reach maturity, and then is killed to make this booze. It, it seemed otherworldly. It seemed just uh, fantastical to me, and I wanted to come see it for myself. So I came to the town of Tequila Jalisco the first time, I think in about 2007, and just fell in love with the town. And knew I wanted to come back, knew I wanted to expose what I had seen here to other people, to people from the United States and outside of Mexico. And uh, the, the idea of doing educational tours was born then. And I started bringing people down in 2008, and we opened La Cata in 2017. Uh, so it's, it's uh, been a lot of learning in a short period of time. Since I've been here, I feel that there's a lack of education mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to tequila, not only in the United States, but uh, globally. Yeah. I mean, all we're learning to do is basically, hey, shot, you know, lick the salt, drink the lime, lemon, wherever you're at. Yeah. Um, and that's basically it. But since being here, I found that, you know, there's some complexity to this and some respectability to how it's produced. And it's totally fascinating for me. And that's why I'm glad I found you because you can explain all of this to not only myself, but to our viewers. So please explain to me yeah. tequila and the types. Well, absolutely. So the first thing you want to know about tequila is that there are two categories. And if you're serious enough to be watching Jeff's show, yeah. you want to be sticking to one category, which is 100% agave tequila. Uh, as everybody watching this knows, all alcohol comes from sugar. We classify different types of alcohols based on what that sugar came from. 100% agave tequila means that 100% of the alcohol in there came from sugar of the blue agave and nothing else. If it doesn't say 100% agave tequila on the label, it just says tequila, that means that up to 49% of that alcohol was derived from non-agave sugars, up to and including high fructose corn syrup. So uh, we avoid that here. Anything you'll see in my bar or around me generally will be 100% agave tequila. Within that, we have five classes of tequila. Um, here we have the four most common. We have Blanco or Plata, also called silver in English. These tequilas are the truest expression of both the agave and the distiller's craft. Uh, purists like myself tend to prefer Blancos. Uh, for people newer to tequila or newer to spirits in general, they might be a little aggressive or a little harsh. If you come from North America or uh, Anglo societies in general, you're more used to brown spirits, so the barrel-aged stuff will be a little friendlier. But the Blanco is, is really the way tequila was born. Uh, and it's really where you get the true essence of the agave. It's also difficult to impossible to hide flaws in a Blanco, uh, so you really know what you're getting there. These spirits are generally completely unaged, generally will have no contact with wood. Per the tequila norm, they can be in contact with wood for up to 60 days. Most Blancos, and certainly traditional Blancos, will not have any contact with wood, so they're true white spirits. In the world of white spirits, agave spirits are the most aromatically and chemically complex white spirits in the world. So you can stand this up next to any, any unaged whiskey, any unaged rum, any vodka, gin, and you're gonna find a much wider array of aromas and flavors in a, in a white tequila. Wow. 
If we take those tequilas and put them in oak for over two months, we have what we can call a reposado, a rested tequila. Uh, these tequilas are very, very popular in Mexico. Uh, they're pretty popular in the United States. In my opinion, this is just opinion, but this is the hardest class of tequila to really, really do well because it's all about balance, it's all about moderation. Uh, you generally want some of that freshness and spiciness and herbality uh, of the Blanco to come through, but you want a little bit of that uh, softer touch and sweetness from the oak uh, to balance that out. It should be neither uh, too far in one direction or, or the other. So reposados, I think, are a very difficult class of tequila to master, but can be very, very nice. Uh, if a tequila is in a oak barrel of no larger than 600 liters for a minimum of a year, we can call it an añejo, which is a one-year-old tequila. Now we're getting deeper into the world of oak. Uh, it can be American oak. Typically, for both reposados and añejos, they're gonna be used American whiskey barrels, uh, but it can be new American, new French, used French, Hungarian, Canadian, any kind of oak you got. If the barrel's no larger than 600 liters and it's been in there for a year, you can call that an añejo. Uh, they're gonna be starting to get darker, take on more uh, chocolate, vanilla, perhaps coffee and hazelnut, cinnamon tones from the barrel. If it's American oak, they're gonna start to drink a little bit more like a whiskey. Um, if it's French oak, it's gonna start to drink a little bit more like a French brandy or a cognac or an Armagnac. In the same maximum size barrel, a minimum of three years, we have extra añejos. And you can see, even just on the color alone, we're now very much into the world of, of the barrel, into the world of oak. These are uh, gonna stand up in, in the best cases against you know, your, your finest whiskeys or, or your finest cognacs or armagnacs. Um, what you have in your hand there, that's what I sold. That's uh, in new French oak barrels uh, for a minimum of three years and will have a lot in common with a cognac. Uh, when they're well aged, it will still definitely speak to you as a tequila, but with a heavy, heavy touch of the barrel. Yeah. I'm a connoisseur, I'm new to, to tequila. I buy, let's say, three or four bottles, different ranges. How should one store the, the tequila in their, their house? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's much less sensitive than wine. It's much less volatile than wine. You don't have to worry about uh, it being open. Ideally, you want it in a cool, darker place, like a kitchen cabinet or something like that. Um, if you're tasting tequila, you want it to be in uh, nice glassware, preferably stemware, uh, and you want it to be at room temperature. If you've already evaluated that tequila, you've already tasted it, you know what you feel about it, you like it, you want to drink it. If you're drinking for pleasure as opposed to tasting to evaluate, uh, if you want to cool it off in the refrigerator, if you want to throw an ice cube in there, uh, I'm you know, quite a, quite a snob when it comes to tequila, but yeah. I see no problem with any of that because you're now at that point drinking for pleasure. It's, it's your liquid, you should do with it what's going to give you the most pleasure out of it. So in terms of tasting, you want it always at room temperature. In terms of drinking, however you like it. Yeah. Storage, cool, dark place. I would say that uh, when the bottle gets lower than halfway, this is a rule of thumb. There, I don't know the, you know that this is the scientific uh, gospel, but in my experience, especially with aged tequilas, when it gets lower than half, you have that much oxygen in there, it's gonna start oxidizing, uh, just like anything else will. It's gonna start evaporating alcohol faster, it's gonna start losing flavor. Uh, so my rule of thumb is when it gets halfway, it's time to drink it. Have some friends over, um, kill the bottle. You know, you can, if it's something special, you can nurse it about halfway down, but once you get to halfway, you either need to put it into a smaller container, which kills a little bit of the romance of, of the label. Yeah. So when I, get, when I get to about halfway, I just have some friends over and, and finish the bottle because otherwise if you hang on to it for too long, it's gonna turn into what we sometimes call agave water, where you've lost the alcohol, you've lost the backbone, and it's very, very mild in flavor. So my biggest thing is, is when I go and shop for tequilas, you know, you see, I mean, there's a, there's a huge range product line I'm looking at. Uh, I see, you know, $20. And I, and I see a range up to you know, 50, 60, $70. My understanding is now from this week and working with a lot of the distilleries is there's a lot that goes in to making tequila. Talk to me about uh, you know, some of these, these misconceptions people mm -hmm. have about spending quality money on a quality product like tequila. Yeah, there's definitely a persistent idea that tequila should be cheap, that's only for parties, for shooters, for, for basic pre-batch cocktails. Um, the fact is, as you've seen, is that it's an extremely labor-intensive process. And the raw material in the form of the blue agave uh, takes a minimum of five or six years to mature. So that's an investment in land that you've got to take care of, that you've got to weed, that you've got to fertilize. Uh, and right now in 2019, we're at a historic peak for the price of agave. Agave has never been more expensive than it is right now. It's about 25 to 27 pesos 
pesos per kilo, which to give you some context for that, about 10 years ago, it was 50 Mexican cents a kilo. So we're talking about a 50X price swing in the raw material. Obviously, you can't increase the bottle price by 50 times or no one would buy it. So there's a real squeeze on the producers, which is a real squeeze on the farmers uh, when, when the price gets low. When the price is high, the farmers are doing well, but the producers have a real squeeze because they can't raise their prices that much. Um, I would encourage everybody, when they look at a bottle of tequila, to think about a couple of things. One is, even the quote unquote worst tequila, even the cheapest tequila that you or I might not find sippable or truly enjoyable, that tequila also started with a lot of work in the fields. That tequila was also made with a plant that took maybe six or seven years to reach maturity. It was planted by hand, it was tended by hand, it was harvested by hand. So to me, all tequila deserves our respect for that reason. Um, all things being equal, it's gonna be more expensive to produce a liquor from an agave, uh, a semi-arid plant that takes these many years to, to produce, whereas your finest whiskey, your finest cognac, is made from a grain or a fruit that took one year to produce, not to take anything away from that, but your basic raw material cost is, is just uh, a, a exponentially different in the case of tequila. When we start to get concerned with, with social issues of, you know, how well are the growers being paid? Is this a family owned brand? How much labor is involved versus is it an entirely industrialized process? Even though salaries are pretty low in Mexico, if you have a handmade product where maybe 30 or 40 different people are, are involved in the process of making it versus a very industrial product uh, where maybe two or three pairs of hands are on that from the beginning to the end, you have a big bump in cost. When you get into the reposados, añejos, extra añejos, if we like these aged versions of the spirits, it's important to keep in mind, especially when you get to the extreme of añejo and extra añejo, uh, that in a place like Jalisco, where most tequila is from, it's a very, very dry, arid environment. So even in a good barrel house, we're gonna have a much higher angel share than in most whiskeys. So it's not out of the question here to lose 10% of volume a year from a barrel. So if we're drinking an extra añejo, that's a minimum of three years. It's entirely possible that a third of that barrel is gone. So you and I as uh, lovers of extra añejo say, we're not only paying for the tequila that's in the bottle, we're paying for the tequila that's gone also. So that's why you're going to see those price jumps and I would encourage people to recognize that because of the raw material and because of the intense amount of labor involved, all things being equal, tequila should be a relatively expensive product compared to other spirit categories. Awesome. Here's the thing guys, like we can look at the statue and it looks cool and everything, but we saw how sharp the cola was. You don't want to be doing that. And, and there's no reason to pass the agave yeah. above your coworkers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just not a statue though, man. Cool statue. <laughs> All right, so last question. Yeah. Talk to me, again, new to tequila, looking at uh, labels mm -hmm. on, on this. You did a great job explaining, you know, the, the different varieties. What else should I be mindful of yeah. when I'm looking at the, the labels here on the tequila? I'm gonna assume that most people watching the show are, are in a market where they're not gonna be dealing with a lot of pirate products or, or pseudo tequilas or things like that. But just in case, and unfortunately it does happen a lot down here in Mexico, you wanna look uh, and see every bottle of tequila somewhere on the label, sometimes it's very prominent, sometimes it's very small. You're gonna see this acronym NOM for Norma Oficial Mexicana. That acronym is going to be on almost any product made in Mexico, from, from engine blocks to washers and dryers to tequila. Then you're going to see a four-digit number, then you're going to see another three-letter uh, three acronym, CRT, for Consejo Regulador de Tequila, the Tequila Regulatory Council. Those three things together in that font tell us that this is a legitimate bottle of tequila. Now the CRT is the watchdog of the industry. It's an independent agency authorized by the Mexican state and funded by the teal industry to enforce and interpret the norm. The norm are the rules about tequila. So they're the tequila police, but they're also the tequila Supreme Court. They, they interpret the law, they enforce the law, and they do quite a good job with this. And what this tells us, it doesn't tell us what's in the bottle is good, that's a matter of taste. But what it tells us is that everything on the label is correct. It tells us that this is a tequila, this is 100% agave tequila, it's in the Blanco class, and that the gnome of this number, yeah, every, every bottle is gonna have a four digit gnome number, which identifies for us what producer is responsible for the tequila in that bottle. So the CRT is guaranteeing to me that this is 100% agave tequila, Blanco, and the gentleman at Simbolo are responsible for what's in this.